Good morning. Welcome to the English Worship Service at Grace Chinese Gospel Church of North York. We're so glad you've joined us this morning. This morning is a special Sunday. It's Social Justice Sunday, where every once a year we remember the church's calling to help people throughout this world. Let's pray. Our eternal God and Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you, Lord, for each person who has joined us online today. We thank you, Lord, for granting your people your justice, your peace, your mercy. You are a God of justice. You care for the weak, the powerless, the needy, the hungry, the lonely, those in pain and suffering. And we are called to be your hands and feet on this earth. So we pray, Lord, that you would use this morning as a challenge to all of us to be involved and as a comfort for those experiencing social injustice, that we may de demonstrate your love and your caring to this whole world. Father, we th thank you for our special speaker this morning, Mr. Michael Messenger from World Vision. We ask your blessing upon him and all of World Vision Canada as they minister throughout Canada and this world, sharing your love to a broken and needy world. Thank you, Father, that you are the source of all comfort and you alone are able to bless and you're, have you chosen to use us, even us. So we commit this morning to you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Our reading for this morning comes from John chapter 4, verses 4 to 9, reading from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. But he had to go through Samaria. So he came to, some, to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus stood, said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a Samaritan, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. This is the word of God. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Now I have the joy of introducing to you this morning our special guest speaker, Mr. Michael Messenger, the CEO and President of World Vision Canada. Our church is heavily involved with World Vision. We've had people who work there, we've involved with, and we will be involved again in the next week with the 6K Walk for Water. We've been involved with the Matthew 25 Challenge. Many of you support and sponsor children through World Vision Canada. Uh, we have involved with the 30-hour famine. And on a more personal note, I don't know if I've ever mentioned this to you, but my family were very poor in India, when, where I was born. And I, along with my siblings, three other siblings, were sponsored rural vision children. They made a huge difference in my life. I have a huge debt. I owe a huge debt to rural vision. And I thank God for them. Mr. Michael Messenger is a wonderful person. I believe he runs marathons like our own Deacon Hoyson. Uh, he's, I met him last week as I, when I spoke at the World Vision Community Service, their chapel. And I just think he's a really wonderful person. So I look forward to hearing his message with you as he speaks about following Jesus to the margins from our text in John chapter 4. Thank you, Mr. Messenger, and we commit this following time to you. Today, I want us to chew on this big idea. Following Jesus leads us to the margins. So let's begin. Now, do you know what I mean when I talk about margins? A great illustration comes from the movie, The Lion King. Now, I think this is one of Disney's best. You know that movie. Uh, it came out in 1994, at least the animated version, and about five years before my kids were born. 
But nevertheless, it was something that was on repeat on our DVD player. I think I know all the scenes all the way through. Do you remember this scene? Uh, the two lions sit on the edge of this cliff and look over the vast expanse of Mufasa's kingdom. Now, to do this right, I really need to try to get a James Earl Jones voice. I'll do my best. Mufasa says to Simba this. <clears throat> One day, Simba, the sun will set on my time here and will rise with you as the new king. And of course, Simba looks out in, in wonder and says, and all this will be mine. Mufasa says, everything the light touches. Everything the light touches, Simba says. But then Simba looks out to the edges, the margins of the kingdom, and asks his dad, what about that shadowy place? And Mufasa's tone changes. Sternly, he says to Simba, that is beyond our borders, and you must never go there, Simba. Mufasa, the Lion King, in other words, just told Simba to stay away from the margins. You must not go there. Did you ever get a Mufasa-like warning growing up? Uh, were there places where your parents told you not to go? Staying safe was the priority, right? Uh, maybe it was a street or a neighborhood or a certain part of town. For me, it was uh, an abandoned day camp in a park across the street from where I lived. You see, we had the chance to do what my parents told us to do, which was to walk to school long distance. We were in a new neighborhood. School was pretty far away. We had to stay on the sidewalk, but it took a long time. Or we could take the dark and, for a young kid, fairly dangerous path through the park and the abandoned day camp. This was a margin, a place where I couldn't go. I was not allowed to go. It wasn't safe. It was different. We could run into wildlife or strange people. Uh, we didn't know what to expect. I suspect for you, maybe your margins were a poor place or a place where people were different. Instead of being told to go there and make a difference, we instead were guided to avoid these places. They were shadowy places. And margins are shadowy places. They're messy places. Margins, to various degrees, are places with difficult problems, desperate people, and dangerous environments. In the margins, we also find people, and often children, who are pushed to the edges, limited by geography, by circumstance, by culture. Marginalized people often lack choice. And today, that marginalization is made even worse by the pressures and the direct and indirect impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. At World Vision, we spend a lot of time in the world's margins. One place that is in the margins where World Vision has a presence is a country called the Central African Republic, or CAR. CAR today is one of the hardest places in the world to be a child. Bob Pierce, the man who started World Vision, wrote this statement in the flyleaf of his Bible. He said, let my heart be broken by the things that break the heart of God. Friends, car is one of those places that break God's heart. I visited there in 2018, and we put together a video that shows a glimpse of what the margins look like in that country. Take a look. Car, Central African Republic. This is a country that barely makes the news. A country many people don't even know exists. It's here that fighting between Christian and Muslim armed groups, the Selika and anti Balaka, plunged the country into chaos years ago. But things have gotten worse. In 2018, the Central African Republic was rated one of the saddest countries on earth. What's happening today isn't just because of Muslim and Christian tensions. These armed groups also clash over the control of resources like diamonds and gold. They take territory by violently attacking villages, killing hundreds of people, burning farms and recruiting children to join their forces.
Déjà, l'enfant qui a quitté 12 ans à l'école, il a déjà 18 ans, il est déjà majeur. Il demande d'être réintégré dans, le, dans la société. Il s'est assassiné à la famille de 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 the crisis in Ka is overwhelming, but it's not like other emergencies. This is a long-standing, forgotten crisis. For any stability to occur, long-term programs tackling the root causes of conflict are required. World Vision has brought together Christian and Muslim faith leaders who are working to break down religious divisions created by armed groups. Even in the midst of chaos, there are pockets of change. In remote villages, child soldiers have been freed from armed groups. Through peace clubs, these youth learn how to promote peace in their communities. Together with World Vision, religious leaders are creating farming groups that work across the lines of faith to promote acceptance between Muslims and Christians. Peace is literally being grown from the ground up. Seeing those images from Carr, they break my heart. They bring back some challenging memories. And you know, I so regret that even recently, we've seen an uptick in violence in Carr, threatening vulnerable communities even more. And that's on top of the impact of the COVID pandemic. Let's be honest. It's hard to hear some of these stories, to look into the margins of our world. Whether they're near or far, whether they're in our lives, our communities, or around the world margins are challenging. But let's talk about what I mean when I say that following Jesus means going to the margins, or at least caring for those in need in those shadowy places. Today, I'd like to look at a short text from the Gospel of John where Jesus ventured into the margins of his world. You're probably familiar with the story of the woman at the well in John chapter 4. I'd actually invite you to open your Bible with us. We're going to look at the words of a section of John 4 today that will help us understand what it means to follow Jesus here. John 4 is a wonderful story of hope and faith. And the whole chapter actually deserves full tr treatment. But I want to look at just the introduction. We'll see that in verses 4 to 9. And we can see how Jesus looks at people in the margins. What can we learn? Well, just before this passage starts, let me give you a little bit of background. Uh, Jesus has just been identified as a successful teacher. Uh, people started saying that he was making more disciples than John the Baptist. So when Jesus heard the rumor mill starting, he decided to leave the area where he was. And this is where we pick up the story. So let's look at John chapter 4, starting at verse 4. It says, Now he, and that means Jesus, had to go through Samaria on the way. Eventually, he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well around noontime. Soon, a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please, give me a drink. He was alone at the time, because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. Now the woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? What did you catch in the reading today? Did you get a sense that even in Jesus' world there were margins? The question for us today is to ask, what can we learn about Jesus interacting in the margins? And by extension, what can we learn about ourselves and as his followers? So the information in these verses is profound when we read the verse carefully against the first century Jewish backdrop. 
So a couple of things to remember. As we read this story, we've got to keep in mind that Jews and Samaritans uh, were not friends. In fact, they would have considered themselves enemies. It's interesting even today how religion has a way of driving conflict. You see, Jews and Samaritans, even though they were from the same background, similar culture, similar language, they had very different ideas about where to worship, what holy book to use, and so on. That's why when you think about Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan elsewhere in the Bible, it's told for this very reason. Because Samaritans weren't meant to be good, they were enemies to the Jews. But yet in Jesus' story there and here, they were neighbors. They were actually people to be loved. So in John 4, we have to understand this story in light of this context. So the first thing I'd like to draw your attention to is that the text says that Jesus had to go through Samaria. The language actually in the original Greek text is quite strong. Often this word is translated as, it is necessary. The Greek word is pronounced day. So why did Jesus have to go? Why was it necessary for him to go there? Well, think about this for a moment. Uh, let me highlight this in case you're not familiar with biblical geography. If we think about uh, over here is the Mediterranean Sea and the, the countries that we're talking about all are around the edge. Down here we have in the south, Judea. Up in the north, Galilee, with Samaria in the middle. Now, Jesus wanted to travel from Judea in the south up to Galilee in the north, where he was kind of escaping the crowds. The acceptable route from Jude the Judea area was to cross over the Jordan River in its southern portion where people could skirt the Samaritan region and then cross back over the Jordan River in its northern portion to Galilee. This wasn't the direct route, but it was the way that Jews traveled so that they could avoid Samaria. Let me put this in terms maybe younger folks would understand. If Jesus and his disciples were using a smartphone in AD 33, these are the settings they might use on Google Maps. Avoid tolls, avoid highways, avoid Samaria. So clearly he could get to where he needed to go, avoiding Samaria. So there had to be another reason. Now, one of the main handbooks for Bible translators says this. The language in this passage where it says that Jesus had to is the same verb where in John 3, just a chapter before, it talks about Jesus or the Son of Man had to be lifted up. So when we think about the way that these words are used, we should think of this as almost a divine necessity. It must have been God's will or God's divine purpose that Jesus should pass through Samaria. There were other ways to get to where he was going. Samaria was on the margin for the Jews, yet it was a divine necessity for Jesus to go through this marginal place. Well, in John's Gospel, we also see this interesting theology where Jesus is an imitator of the Father. Uh, in John 5, verse 17, uh, it says later on, Jesus is actually accused of working on the Sabbath. And you'll remember that he defends himself by saying, my Father is always at work to this very day, and I too am working. Jesus is the obedient one. He imitates what his father does, what his father commands. In every way, Jesus is in step with God. So much so that Jesus says to his disciples that the one who sees him also sees his father. My pastor sometimes says that Jesus was God with skin on. And Jesus shared his father's heart. And God's heart beats for those in the margin. That's not really surprising. You know, if we go back in the Hebrew scriptures in the Old Testament, we read passages again and again, like this one in Deuteronomy, where it says that God defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow, and he loves the foreigners residing among you. Now, another interesting piece of information in these verses is the use of the word nearby. Did you catch how the deep history of God's story for the Jewish people is near or nearby this Samaritan village? In verse 4, uh, we're told that the village of Sychar is nearby to the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. And Jacob's well is there too. This sounds familiar. I mean, Jacob and Joseph are big names in the Old Testament storylines. 
And the gospel writer makes the point that all of this rich history, core to Jewish identity and culture and religion, is nearby. He specifically points out these key connections. Also, did you know that the word nearby is actually the same word that can be translated as neighbor? All you have to do is add an article like the to the Greek term, and it means literally the nearby ones, which is translated as neighbor. This is the same word that's used in the great commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. Isn't it interesting how John uses this word to describe Samaria and Samaritans, to describe the margins? John is essentially trumpeting, hey Jews, you are connected to this story, and the people here are your neighbors. Jesus sees our neighbors in the margins. The challenge for us is, do we see what Jesus sees? Well, Jesus now in the text goes even further into the margins. Not only has he entered a region that is off limits to most Jews, but he interacts with one who is in her own marginalized state in this context. First of all, women in this context, this place, were second class. A Jewish man talking alone with a woman who is not his wife was unheard of. But we know that there's even more to her story. Margins beyond margins in a manner of speaking. The woman who came at the well herself had been ostracized. We know this because we see the way that Jesus is interacting with the woman at the well and when. First of all, there were no other women there. And second, she came at noontime to draw water in the heat of the day. You know, in my travels with World Vision around the world, uh, I have spent a lot of time with women and children talking and socializing and learning around wells. For many places, many villages, that's the social connection. Going to draw water is something that we do together, that women connect with, build friendships. And it's often done in the cool of the morning or the cool of the evening. Here in this story, we get a sense that in this Samaritan community, they have put this woman out into her, her own shadowy place, a telltale sign of being in the margins. I'll pause there and just ask ourselves, are there other telltale signs in our own communities that we can look to see that people are outcasts today? Maybe in your, our homes, our families, our schools, our neighborhoods. Here we see this woman is a Samaritan. She's a woman and an ostracized woman. Each one of these factors marginalized her. And yet, as she stood at the well, Jesus in a single sentence indicates that he sees her as valuable and not rejected. Please give me some water, he says. Now, some versions omit the word please. To us, that may actually sound a little rude. But he speaks to her and acknowledges her presence and her worth. I wonder if he hadn't been quite so forthright, uh, if she would have even have heard him. You know, are, are you talking to me, she might have asked. He even, he even indicated that he would be willing to drink from her ladle, which was so shocking even to her that she said to Jesus, how can you even ask me that? Well, that takes us to the end of the introduction. John 4 goes on to tell a remarkable story, including the moment when Jesus reveals himself to be the Messiah, the first time in his ministry, not to a king, not to a religious leader, not even to his own disciples, but to this woman. But I'm going to leave that story, the rest of the story, for your pastors for another time. Because we have so much to learn just from this profound introduction. We learn that God's heart is for those in the margins. That the Son of God, in perfect imitation of his Father, went to the margins. And that the people in the margins are our neighbors. This snapshot of Jesus going through nearby Samaria, reaching out to a Samaritan woman at the well, it's a picture of Christ and God's kingdom. We get a glimpse of what it means to live in God's reality. What do we see? God is the God of the margins. His love reaches out to the edges, to the fringes, to those shadowy places. 
So are you getting where we're going? Where God wants to lead us? Following Jesus means having him lead us to the margins. If you and I want to follow Jesus, it is necessary to go to the margins. If we are to be Christ-like, Christ-minded, Christ-led, our new trajectory is to move out of the center to the margins. Do you know what Christian means? It actually means little Christs, little Jesuses. That's who we are. We should act like him and value the things and people that Jesus did. And this story we know actually includes people who did follow Jesus to the margins, his disciples. Now, in the introduction, we just see Jesus, the Samaritan woman, but we're ref- we know that the disciples came with him and are off to get food. They were in this unexpected place and meeting marginalized, unexpected people because they were simply following Jesus. Later in the story, we see that they were astonished when they saw him talking to the woman at the well. It violated almost all of their understandings about the margins and their culture and their people because Jesus showed a different way. The disciples didn't understand everything. (laughs) Sometimes if you look at the text in the Bible, you kind of think that they didn't understand Jesus most of the time. But they followed him and it changed everything. So how do we follow Jesus to the margins? Well, there are lots of ways we need to pursue this. The question is, what will you do? What will I do? What will we do together to make our way there as we follow Jesus? This is huge. Remember when I said earlier that during Disney's Lion King, Mufasa's uh, utterance to Simba was, that is beyond our borders and you must never go there? Let me contrast what Mufasa said to Jesus, who is called also a lion, the Lion of Judah. The Lion of Judah roars in the Bible. He says, I will build my church to be the light of the world, to do the good works of mercy, justice, and love, and the gates of hell that have imprisoned the vulnerable and the weak, children, families, and communities will not prevail. Jesus is the king of a new kingdom. Just like we see that glimpse in Isaiah 65, never again will there be an infant who lives but for a few days or an old man who does not live out his years. A new kingdom and a new earth. I want to follow that king. And God is calling all of us to. Now, of course, we can find people, families, communities, all on the margins, even in our own community. Some of the margins God calls us to are right in our own backyard. It doesn't take long to think of marginalized people or groups. Because when we see how Jesus sees, we notice. But at World Vision, we have a particular calling to follow Jesus to the margins in some of the world's toughest places, usually outside of our borders. To us, these places, however remote, however difficult, however dangerous or shadowy, are nearby. You know, in the Gospel of Matthew 25, um, Jesus talks about the people that he calls the least of these. Who are the least of these in the world today? Many of them are girls and boys in places, fragile places, like Central African Republic, or other challenging parts parts of the world, like Afghanistan, where I visited before the pandemic. I went to Afghanistan to see our work in this fragile context. And I realized that, you know, when we, we don't talk about marginalized people as, a, a, as just a group, these are individual girls and boys, mothers and fathers, families and community members who have names and stories. Just like the story of Banesh. I met Banesh in a mobile health clinic in Afghanistan. I was there seeing some of World Vision's work and meeting with families who were, had been affected by drought. They had been displaced from their homes because of a lack of food and clean water and shelter. And Banesh was in one of our mobile health clinics getting medical care. Banesh was 14 years old. And when I sat down to talk to her, I quickly realized though that she was not just there to get care as a child. She was there because she was nine months pregnant with her second child. Banesh was getting maternal care in anticipation of trying to have a healthy child. 
instead of playing, instead of uh, enjoying childhood, she had been sold essentially into marriage, forced marriage at the age of 11 to a man much older than her as part of their cultural practices, as what was seen as economic desperation in that context. We had a chance to talk with Banesh, who said that she hoped for her children not to have this same experience. She hoped that her daughters would grow up with the opportunity to live up to their full potential, to get the education that she's never had. I'm glad that World Vision was able to help Banesh and her family to get that kind of care that was needed for her children to grow up healthy. But there was not much we could do to change the story that Banesh was living. And frankly, we hear stories like that, and it's hard not to feel overwhelmed. Some of you may even be panicking right now, thinking that I'm going to tell you that to follow Jesus means hopping on a plane and going to Afghanistan. That's not true. You may be called exactly to where you are right now. In fact, right now, I'd invite you to stay away from Afghanistan. But it doesn't mean that you can't go and reach out and support activities reaching children like Banesh in the margins. Well, let's go back to the snapshot of, of this, this story once more in John 4. You see that the disciples weren't immediately with Jesus because they had gone to the market to buy food. Have you ever wondered where the disciples got the money that they were going to spend to buy the food? Well, we know. We know from Luke's gospel, chapter 8, we learn that there were faithful women who followed Jesus as well. We learn the names of some of them, like Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Susanna, as well as many others who are left unnamed. Now, they weren't front and center. They weren't actually able, for their own cultural reasons, to be with Jesus in Samaria but they are critical to this story. All of them were told, provided for the 12 disciples and Jesus out of their resources. Luke's after, actual words were that they served them out of their resources. They served Jesus and became partners in his mission by providing for him and the 12 disciples. The entire Samaritan mission that started in John chapter 4 right here, with Jesus' two-day visit in that territory, was facilitated by people who themselves were not evil, even able to be there. But their partnership with Jesus became a catalyst for an entire people beginning their journey toward Jesus. At world Vision, we want to be a partner with you to help reach the extreme margins of the world. By providing support, you're helping us reach the margins to go to those places. Support for organizations like ours help us to help change children's lives. Uh, for example, by sponsoring children, long-term community development. Helping us stand up against injustice and ensuring that there are laws that, that might be keeping people poor that are changed, that are ensuring that children can fight poverty and injustice. Today, you're helping us by supporting our humanitarian emergency relief efforts, including our fight against COVID-19 and the global pandemic, the largest humanitarian response in our history. So what do we do with this? Well, let me leave you with some simple homework, some simple steps to help us go to the margins. The first is learn more about how your church is reaching those on the margins, right in your own community and around the world. Check out the partnership with World Vision. Learn more about World Vision's work. This week, look around. See how Jesus sees and see if there's somebody that you sense might be sitting on the margins that you need to move toward, build a relationship with. And of course, we need to pray. Pray how we as individuals, as followers of Jesus, as a church, as a community, can together follow Jesus to the margins. I want to leave you with a final story, once again, from the Central African Republic. You know, we're in the season of Lent right now, moving towards Easter. That was when I visited Central African Republic as well. In fact, it was right near the beginning of Holy Week, and I was in one of the worst affected areas, most conflict and affected and violent areas of Central African Republic on Palm Sunday. Now, for a time, I went to an Anglican church, and I remember on Palm Sunday, we would all be passed out with a little palm frond, and we would go on a little march around our courtyard saying Hosanna. Well, when I was in Central African Republic, that was not enough. 
we were given whole palm branches, joined more than 500 members of that church and the whole community, and walked not just not around the courtyard, not around the church, but around the entire community. About a five kilometer procession as we circled that community that had been affected so badly by violence and pain and sin and difficulty. And we proclaimed that Jesus was coming. Hosanna. We were welcoming the light arriving in the darkness, recognizing that God, Jesus, was already at work in that community. As I joined that procession, as we walked around that community, I realized you know, that that sense that, that I was part of something bigger, that we were responding to Jesus' call was profound. And it's something that God offers all of us to, to be part of, to join the work that he is already doing in bringing light into even the most shadowy of places. Let's reach the margins together. Let's continue to answer God's call. Let's follow Jesus' lead and reach out even to those tough places, to the world's most vulnerable girls and boys. Thank you so much for letting me be with you today. God bless you. Let's rise for doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Let's receive a benediction. May the love of our Heavenly Father and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all as you receive your commission to go to the ends of the earth to bring the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ now and forevermore. Amen. Amen, Amen, Amen. You all may be seated. Thank you, Mr. Messenger, for giving us such a wonderful message and challenging us to go to the ends of the earth to bring the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's time for the announcements. This coming Saturday, it's a day that we walk 6K walk for water for the people who don't have fresh drinking water. So please join at the location to Good Pond and do it together as a team. Or you can do it on your own as well. It's to raise a uh, fund and to bring fresh drinking water. And there are so many people who don't have fresh drinking water. If you cannot take a walk, you can sponsor to those who are walking for this very wonderful, meaningful cause. This coming Thanksgiving, we are having congregational Thanksgiving night. Uh, it's very special. We are having it as praise and testimony night. It's happening October 8th, Friday at 7 p.m. We have a special guest. Her name is Rachel Luck. She is a Toronto-based award-winning singer and songwriter and worship leader. Her song was uh, featured during our summer retreat. She's amazing worship leader. Uh, you don't want to miss this praise night and also testimonies the members will share. So please mark this date, October 8th, Friday at 7 p.m. You can gather together amongst yourselves if you can and celebrate this, this Thanksgiving night together. And the link that you see on the screen will be sent to your cell leader. From a children ministry, if you have children from two and a half to 11 years old, please register them online so they can enjoy uh, learning in the word of God through the ministry. Our online church begins at 11 a.m. 
and worship begins at 11.15 a.m. And our YouTube premiere remains at the same time at 11.30 a.m. If you'd like to help in our media ministry, please contact the email address media at gcgcny.org. Please check our Instagram to listen to a pastoral video to help yourself in your walk with Jesus Christ. And never too late to join any of the Sunday school classes for teens, one on Saturday and the other one on Sunday. You can call the number and receive prayer encouragement from Reverend Ted. You can also check our church website to watch our pastoral video. Join any of those prayer meetings you like to join and help our church grow through your prayer. Let's become cheerful and faithful giver to our Lord Jesus Christ with all that he has given to us. You can receive up to eight free counseling sessions from Living Water Counseling Center. Next meet and greet will be happening October 10th at 12.30. This coming Sunday, Reverend Ted will be preaching titled Thankfulness, another mark of a disciple. Thank you for having joined to this beautiful Sunday service. May His grace be with you until we meet again. Bye.